Stop hoping for your business to grow and start mastering the formula for success that every entrepreneur needs to grow their business. Join us for 5 Plus 1 Mastery, where every week we go in-depth on how to grow your business the right way. Learn more at 5plus1mastery.com. Behave and think in a way that when you look back on it two years from now, you're proud of how you how how courageous and how stalwart and how strong you were in this difficult time. I'm your host, Chaz Wilson. I bring you successful entrepreneurs, add valuable wisdom to your journey, and help you succeed. Welcome to Connect, Share, and Prosper. Hey, everybody. Welcome to this episode of Connect, Share, Prosper. So welcome to this episode of Connect, Share, Prosper. Uh, we are going live on our Master Networks Facebook page. So uh, make sure you make a comment. Tell your friends that you're here. If you're listening to this through recording, we're glad you're with us. Uh, my guest today is someone, if you've been around Master Networks, it's a familiar face. Uh, if, you're, if you're new to our channel here. Uh, probably we're both unfamiliar faces then. So my name is Chaz Wilson. I'm the host of Connect Share Prosper, also the founder and CEO of Master Networks. And I'm joined today uh, with the Dean of Master Networks University and my good friend, Dave Jenks. Dave, thanks for joining me today on Connect Share Prosper. Chaz, it is an honor to be here, my friend. So today, Dave, I said to you, I messaged you in preparation for this uh podcast. We're both doing this a little bit different today than I'm not in the studio today. It's virtual. And I said, you know, I, I'd like us to talk about and share some life stories. You and I often get the opportunity to talk about business and personal development and some of that, but there's some power in some of our stories. Number one, we can uh, have a little fun with it today and um, and also just share some life experiences. Are you, are you good with that? I am really good with that. In fact, I think it's really important, Chaz, you know, that in, 19, in 2014, I decided to go on a homeless journey. Uh, it was in, so I was March 1st, 2014. I went on three years of just traveling the country with my Jeep Grand Cherokee, my two mountain bikes, my golf oh, course, yes, bunch of informal clothes and all of that. But the reason I wanted to bring that up was that, um, you see, in that time, I had all this windshield time and I, I, I honored that. I really didn't fill it with a lot of noise and books and you know, music and things like that. Sometimes, yes, of course, but I really, I really used it as think time. And what I did was re uh, really review my entire life, probably three times uh, in detail. And the more I would think about certain times in my life, the more I details would come and I'd remember. And I, I, I remember reading recently in a neuroscience book that I was reading how important our memories are to us. Mm, yes. When people, we know when people go later in their life and they get into their cognitive issues and they lose short-term memory and they don't know what they had for breakfast and then they begin to not remember people's yeah. names and all that, you know, they really lose their way. But the other one that's interesting is that if you lose your memories of your early life, you have no identity. And, and people that have had yeah. that happen to them are really have trouble. So the reason I think this is important, I think it's good for all of us to kind of remember our lives and those stories that were foundational because they've led us to be who we are today. So I know. So let's start foundationally. So, Dave, I know you were born in New York. Uh, Niagara Falls, New York, five miles Niagara. from the Canadian border. <laughs> five miles from the Canadian border. And siblings, where do you fall? Do you have siblings? How do you fall in the mix there? I'm the oldest of five boys. My mom wow. and dad, Cliff and Jane, had five boys, and uh, I was the oldest. So interesting. I'm an oldest child as well. There's come yeah. some, there comes some responsibility in being yeah, the oldest. No pressure. No, it's all pressure. It's. I'm not going to take it on as responsibility. It's all pressure. All pressure. <laughs> yeah, it's, That's right. it's why. It's why firstborns go to more therapy than any other of the, <laughs> of the orders is because there's just too much pressure. <laughs> yeah. So. So, well, let's talk about that pressure. So here you are, the oldest of five. Yeah. Uh, what was that like, especially in the early days in New York? And and what, what's the age difference like from you to the youngest? Well, it's, it's 12 years between me and the youngest and uh, three and a half, almost four years uh, between me and the second. So I had that classic thing where you're the spotlight, everyone's attention. And yeah, maybe they're doing a lot of things that, you know, you know, you, they're trying for you to be the good kid. They're trying to be the really good parents. But really what happens is when the second one comes along, all of a sudden the spotlight's gone. Uh -huh. Now the spotlight's over to them. And then the next one comes and the spotlight's on them. And mom is all busy taking care of the young kids, changing diapers, all that stuff. And, you know, you're, you know, 
your chopped liver. So the thing is that, that you really, that creates an interesting dynamic. And I tried for many, many years to regain that spotlight, to prove myself as the, you know, as the boy wonder, as the oldest boy. And that really created a lot of pressure that I had to learn to let go of because I didn't need yeah. to prove myself to anyone, but I thought I did, right? Trying to, yeah, re yeah. Trying to regain that. Yeah. So uh, how long did you live in New York? How long were you there? Were you there most of your childhood? Oh. Oh yeah, all of all of my childhood. We I I went to five uh, different uh, schools uh, between um, between kindergarten and uh, a second grade, and then I was in a one uh, a two room schoolhouse, three grades in one side with one teacher, and then three grades four through six in the second room with a second wow. teacher. That's really interesting to be in one of those kind of country schools, and and then. I, I, my uh, seventh grade was in, was in a, was in a, a Sunday school of a church, even though it was a public school that was, they had re rented this space. And then the, the eighth grade was in what we called Bites's barn. Mrs. Bites had a barn and she had rehabbed the lower floor where all the stanchions were for cows and all that. So there were gutters around the corner and all that. I mean, it wasn't a bad, it wasn't a bad place. They had really reconditioned it, but it was, it was the bottom of an old farm. Wow. A barn, an old barn, and that was eighth grade. And then, then I went to this centralized high school for four years, and we really, we really went legit. <laughs> yeah, and my kids are complaining about having to use the dining room table right now. With exactly, school, right? You know? Exactly. <laughs> tell, tell them, tell them that that uh, Dave, Dave had 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 it was uh, did his seventh grade around cow stanchions. <laughs> so. Uh, and in those kind of early development years, like, you know, especially as an oldest child, I'm thinking like for me as well, what were some of the early, you know, like that means, you know, you're, you're first to go to high school, yeah. you're the first yeah. to get a job, the first, first all those things. Yeah. What were some of those? There's, 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 there's one side that, that is, or there's two sides that are positive. I think, even though they didn't feel like it at the time, the pressure to be an, uh, an achiever, you were the first child. They put a lot of pressure on you. I got a lot of attention. So I got a lot of, tr you know, education training. I had aunts that were very good with giving us books. And so I got a lot of encouragement about school. Uh, and so I was a high achiever in school all the way through school, including athletics and that sort of thing. It kind of had that that drive. Part of it was to prove myself, but part of it was just because I had encouragement and support. But I think the other thing was um, was the, the way my dad was a disciplinarian. He was an old fashioned disciplinarian, you know, which we would say today was a child abuser. <laughs> you know, oh, yeah. Uh, in yeah, the, yeah. In the, he he delivered the 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 hand and the belt and the paddle, right? I mean, that yeah, was yeah. well, and he, he laid on me a couple of times early that were really very severe. And, and the reason I say that is it, it may be very uh, hyper vigilant. I would not test those boundaries where I could get spanked again. So I was a good little boy, you know, because yeah. I was so yeah. attuned uh, and it's made me attuned to things going on around me, maybe more than most people hyper vigilant about things that could go wrong and where I might make a mistake. But the other one that was funny, and this is just a funny one that I had to reflect on once, and it made me really realize. So dad's view was this. Um, I was the oldest, and any time there was a, a, a problem uh, that anyone got hurt or there was some sort of issue, his view was out. He came out, he hit the oldest one there, and then asked questions. <laughs> so it, was yeah. always, it was almost always I was the oldest one. So yeah, yeah. I knew if something went wrong, I was going to get hit. Well, so what I learned was this. When my youngest, one of my youngest brothers, we'd be playing tag or something, and, and maybe one of the other brothers would hit him too hard or tag him or throw him into a tree, and he'd start crying and headed for the back door. I knew I had like 20 seconds to calm him yeah, down. Yeah, yeah. Or yeah. I'm going to get delivered. So I learned how to build rapport. Oh, Mark, what happened? Oh, I can't believe John did that. Oh, my God. Let me take, let's, hey, here, come here, Mark. Let's go take care of John right now. You ready? Let's, he shouldn't have done that to you, right? And I get his attention. And then all of a sudden, I kind of work this out and start, you know, well, I became a really good mediator. Yeah, the early days of your mediation, <laughs> right there. The mediation. I learned how to do it just for, just for survival. <laughs> wow. Pretty amazing. Yeah. I mean, those are interesting development stories that you talked about as well, being uh, kind of overachiever in athletics and stuff. I'm curious, what was your sport? What was, the, what were you? Well, I would, I did them all because I, I had the really fortunate thing was I went to a small, I think there were 105 people in my graduating class in high school. So the mm -hmm. high school had maybe five or 600 kids in it. 
and it was a centralized school and they were just opening up. So they didn't have a long tradition of, of athletic performance and all of that. So I, pl I played them all. I mean, it was football, basketball, baseball. I, yep. mean, I, was a, I was a letterman in each of that, all four of my years. Good for you. Uh, so it was just because it was there, right? I mean, I would not yeah, yeah. modern high school today. I wouldn't have a chance, but because I wasn't like a great athlete, I was just one who wanted to be a good one. So yeah, so that that was a, that was a great opportunity for me. And by the way, participation is a big deal. I, I say to a lot of people who want to go, you know, should I go to this big college, the small one? I say pick a small one. And the reason is that a small one, you can you can learn things and do things that at a big one, you're going to have to be super specialized. You know, like in college for me, um, once I stopped doing sports, I became a sports editor of the local of the college newspaper. Well, I in three years, I became its editor. So I was editor of this college newspaper, which is like a big responsibility. And I learned so many things there about writing and organizing and getting people to do things and meeting deadlines and all of that. But if I had been at a big university, I'd have had to be a journalism major to even mm -hmm. have a chance yeah. to maybe write stories on the newspaper. So that small school gave me the chance for life opportunities that I otherwise wouldn't have had. Yeah. I mean, you think about, I always think about these experiences that I had that at the time, you know, you know, I think about, I had opportunities to play football. I went to a school uh, it didn't work out the way I wanted to, but that's where I met my wife. And so I think like in the moment you have plans, you have these ideas, you have these right. dreams and sometimes they don't go the way you think, but it's another door opening up yeah. as part of that. So I love what you were talking about with being, um, you know, the editor of a paper and how, you know, all the lessons you learned there, who are some of the early, like, who are some of the early mentors you had in your well, life? You know, what's interesting. Um, yeah. Well, you know, cause early, early, I mean, I had I had two or three really good teachers and they really encouraged me. And uh, one, you know, that was in the grade school, one of the the two in the two room schoolhouse, the one in the younger grades uh, was really just a, a sweetheart of a lady. And she was so encouraging. And then I had a math teacher who was very encouraging. But uh, one of the things that I, I really learned was from my work experiences. You know, it was really that was one of the things I think that was good in. <laughs> in the sense in my dad's uh, tough disciplinary way, I, I remember going to my mother and saying, Hey, I want, I want a, I want a bigger allowance than the 25 yeah. I got a week. Right. Yeah. And, Cause I had certain, and I said, I'll, I'll do more duties. If you want more things done around, I'll do them to earn it. And yeah. she said, well, nah, I don't think we can. I said, no, I really would like that. So she finally went to my dad and said, you know, Dave wants to make more money. He said he'd do more work, but he really wants more money. And my dad went to me and said, Oh yeah. If you're not happy with what you're getting, we'll take that away too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I went, oh, 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 right? I mean, it was like, don't ask for what you want. That's the downside. Now, the positive side was I realized if I was going to have extra money, I would have to go work for it. You know, so I did the classic lawn mowing, grocery, you know, uh, working at a grocery store, stocking shelves, uh, and farm work. Did a massive amount of farm work. And that really was good and for me because it was physical, yeah. it was outdoor. Yep. Yeah. And I and also I had I got to be around farmers uh, who uh, who who I learned about what it was like to to run a farm. You know, mm -hmm. one, one guy I worked for named John Hall. Uh, I went to work for him between my junior and senior year in uh, high school, and I had to ride my bike five miles to get to their place, and um, had to be there at five a.m. to milk the cows, and then couldn't you know had to milk the cows later in the day around five. PM before I could head home. So it was a long day, but here's the thing. Sadly, uh, I, I started working with him right after school let out in, in June and around July 1st, he had a heart attack. Oh boy. And so he, he was laid up and I had, I was supervised by his wife, but I was the guy. I wow. was the hand. I was doing everything. I was doing the milking. I was. Wait, like, so how old, how old were you at this time then? Uh, between my junior and senior year. So 16 years 16, old. 16. And all that. You all know, that responsibility on you. All that response, but boy, but holding that, you know, yeah. and, and feeling that responsibility and doing all the work, but it also gave me an appreciation uh, for what farmers work is like, you know, yeah. I mean, you know, it's, it, it's, it's so multifaceted and so many things you have to take care of. Yeah. I, I mean, there's just something I, I it's such so cliche in a sense, but it's so true. There's something about 
physical labor, physical work. Yes. Um, I think about early, uh, early high school days. I had jobs working in some cornfields. We'd have to get up before the sun came up and you'd go pull these, you know, rogue corn that would come up and, right. and, and it was all day hot and humid oh. and bugs and all that stuff. And, you know, we didn't get paid a lot, but you know, what's okay. interesting is the, the way I treated that money was different too, as a 16 year old, yeah. I'd work so hard for it. Oh yeah. No, you really learn the value of the money. Now yeah. you also like the independence. I could go buy a Ricky Nelson, uh, you know, 45, if mm -hmm. I wanted to, you know, or Elvis or whomever I could. So I had the freedom to go spend that money, but then I was very cautious about how I spent it because I knew there was a limit. Yeah. yeah. So you, you learned these lessons, these life lessons early. And, and uh, I'm curious because, you know, you and I have talked about kind of the stage we're in now for both of us, different stages, but, but we're both mentoring people right now. And yeah. you've been a great mentor in many ways for me. And I'm so curious who, who are some of the early mentors for you and how did they impact your life? Well, it's interesting. I had three in my, uh, one of whom was part of my early college experience. His name was Dr. Cliff Thorne, and he was the Dean of Students of my college, State University of New York at Albany, uh, which had been a teacher's college for many years and now was transitioning in. And now it's a mega, mega university. And yeah. I was right there during that transition time. Uh, but anyway, he, he, you know, I, I worked as a, uh, first of all, he, he really paid attention to what I was doing with student activities, editor of the newspaper, all that stuff. I'd interviewed him a few times. So he had this good impression of who I was as a student. Uh, and then, and then uh, he, uh, uh, he hired me to come back to, to, for my second job. My first one was in a college university. This one was to be the director of alumni relations and fundraising. I'd never done either one. So it really moved me into that world of asking for things and leading organizations. Right. And there I was like in my twenties, late twenties, leading an organization that was powered up with, uh, you know, 70 year olds and 80 year olds. These, these ladies would come in from the class of 20 and they were just feisty as could be. Right. And I was this, you know, whippersnapper. But anyway, what he taught me, and this was an, is how to be an executive. And he had one thing I'll never forget. He said, the unplanned day is not worth living. Oh, wow. That was heavy. And he also told me about how he organized. His desk was one of these super clean desks, nothing too little, you know, an inbox and outbox on it, wooden on a big, beautiful desk. Everything else was clean. He said, he said, here's what I tell my assistant. There's one of two places where things are. They're either in that one of those baskets or you know where it is. Oh, it's so that good. Interesting. That's so good. Yeah. So yeah. I learned about what it was to have a good executive assistant and to empower them and then also to hold them accountable. So yeah, that was he was a great lesson in in leadership and executive executive management. Well, yeah. so if Elizabeth, my executive assistant's listening, she's not real. She she realizes next week we're gonna because I got a pile here and a that's pile right. here and a pile oh, that's here. Right. So sadly, oh. sadly, I didn't. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I'm not a clean desk guy, so I really didn't learn my lesson. I did learn about the unplanned day, but I would say that I have my own stack yeah. method, my own piling method of organization. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I generate too much paper. See, he's an executive, and I'm a teacher thinker, right? So uh, to me, collecting things that's my research. That pile is my research, right? And and I know where it's like an archaeological dig. I know how far down the pile <laughs> something right. is, and so I can find it. But yeah. uh, it, it's uh, it's not the same method he had. He was truly an executive. Yeah. So you said you're a teacher thinker. Where where and when did you know, or how did you know you were a teacher? Well, it's interesting. I think as oldest of five boys, you ended up having to do a lot of general teaching uh, of, of people, right? Because you were sort of supervising. And we ran a thing called the Jenks Home Library. I fortunately had uh, an aunt who was the head librarian and a specialist in children's uh, mm -hmm. books uh, at the Cuyahoga County Library in Cleveland, Ohio. And so she would, she would deliver us every time she visited a big box of books. We had this collection of books. What a, what a gift that was. But mm -hmm. we, I started this thing called the Jenks Home Library. So every Saturday morning during the summer, we'd put all these books out on the back porch on tables and we had them all done with the, you know, little cards in them where you'd sign them out and all that stuff. We had this real library system. And so we became the kind of local library for all the kids in the neighborhood. And wow. that, you know, kind of that sort of taking on the responsibility. And I think I always admired my teachers. I had good teachers. 
So then I really, my undergraduate was to, was to become a math and physics teacher uh, in secondary schools. And I never did that. I got certified to do it. But then sort of everywhere I went, I became a teacher. When I got into sales and marketing, I took the Dale Carnegie sales course. And then they asked me to become an instructor with them. Uh, and so what was that like? I'm curious, you know, what was that like to be an instructor for Dale Carnegie? Well, what first a of all, Dale, Dale Carnegie, what, what we, people need to respect, I mean, it's probably still the greatest adult education oh, yes. organization in the world, maybe even currently in terms of number of graduates, but certainly historically, right? And so Dale Carnegie wrote these famous books. They're still in the top 200 every year on Amazon, and he wrote them in the 1930s. That's how classic they were. But he began this course. I... The first one I took was the sales course, which was really developed after him. He wasn't part of that, but it was it had that same that same idea in the way they treated instructors. Now, their qualifications to become an instructor was was amazing. What you had to memorize, what you had to demonstrate, the number of times you had to work with another senior instructor. And then the final thing was you had to go for a three weekend trip. I was in Albany, New York, down to New York City. And you had to teach uh, a, a training class. I mean, they were, they were, they were made, I think they were discounted how much people paid to get in the class. But you, you and two other, you know, wannabe instructors were there teaching it. And in the back of the room was this guy called Dominic. I forget his last name, but he was a retired New York cop, New York City cop. And uh, his job was to qualify people to become instructors. And he did not want anyone they couldn't do it to be a Dale Carnegie instructor. I mean, he cared about the standards. So I knew he was going to be there and that was going to be tough. And that's one of those things, Chaz, about overcoming fear because I was so afraid of his judgment that I tried to opt out of going. And oh, wow. And I just, I told the you guy. Because you knew he was going to be there? I Oh, yeah. Because I had yeah, seen yeah. him at training programs and that, you know, knew who he was. And he had a reputation too of being tough. And so I just, you know, I was very sensitive about being judged. So, and failing, of course, I didn't want to do that. Sure. So anyway, I wanted to opt out and, uh, and, and I learned an important lesson because my, the, the guy who was the, the um, institute manager in Albany said, Dave, you know, I know you're afraid, uh, but I, you're, you're going to be good. And I went, I'm, what do you mean? I'm not afraid. I'm just too busy. Right. I get my, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So anyway, I, he finally encouraged me and I went and of course it was such a cornerstone experience. And I would say, because I, walked through that fear and went and did it. And I got high fives from Dominic. He thought it, it was really good. And that really then I think propelled me, Chaz, for all of the teaching and leading that I've done in all my life. If I had mm -hmm. let that fear stop me, then I might not have ever accomplished what I've accomplished. So, you know, you've heard me say it before, but for me, fear is a compass. If you're afraid yeah. of it, you were meant to do it. That's my greatest example right there. Well, so what's interesting is that experience was pivotal because well for you but then that like fast forward to you and i connecting yes together and building the foundations of master networks i remember you saying to me which some people don't know this about me but inherently i'm more shy than people even know and i i was as a child i was very yeah. very shy as a child yeah. and and i remember you saying to me that i would need to get good at public speaking i would need to get comfortable with getting in front of people and training and stages because I would need to share the master networks message. I'd need to train my people. And I was like, well, and I remember not that I wouldn't, didn't want to do that or, but similar to you, I was, well, I don't know if, you know, maybe we can find somebody who's really good at it. Or maybe, you know, maybe we go hire that person who's really good at it. And I remember you saying those similar things that it yeah. sounds like you learned at that very moment yeah. You passed those to me. And it was, it was keenly important. Well, I've said that to so many people because it really is a life lesson I've learned. Let fear be your compass. There's only there's only yeah. one reason you're afraid emotionally to do something. It's one thing to be afraid of walking out in the street or near a cliff sure. or the sure. Grand Canyon or something. Physical dangers I get. But when it comes to emotional resistance and emotional fears, uh, the only reason you are afraid is because you care about how it turns out. Yes. Right? You care about the outcome. So if you yes. care about the outcome, it means, well, are meant to do it. So as Susan, you know, just feel the fear, do it anyway. And I think that's a good thing. It's okay to acknowledge the fear. It's okay to say, I'm afraid. I'm, I'm not sure about myself here. This is going to be a challenge, but then go do it anyway. And typically it never is as bad as you anticipated it would be, you know? Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. How did how did you feel? Like so you get the high fives and Oh, oh, I just came out of that flying. I mean, flying, yeah. just flying, you know, and then I, I also helped me understand as I later became an instructor in the Dale Carnegie basic course in human speaking and uh, public speaking and human relations, right? That general, which so many people come to with the fear of public speaking, right? Mm -hmm. Getting in front of a woman speaking. And what I understood was helping them overcome that fear would change their life. So as wow. an instructor, I was very dedicated to giving them the encouragement, the support, the, the whatever it took for them to overcome that fear and start to speak in front of people. And then I knew that when that when that happened, that that, that would generalize to a lot of parts of their life. In other words, that overcoming the fear of one thing like public speaking would then make them more confident in of all aspects of their life. And I found that to be true. So it's interesting as I have, be, as I'm familiar with your, your career background, I can see now, like as you're sharing these stories, I can see how the, the early mentor of teaching you how to be organized as an executive and, and those executive skills. And then the, the experience of learning how to be a teacher and training in front of, I can see how that has served yeah. you over let the years. Let me share one other teaching thing that was really important. That, that So when I became director of alumni relations, uh, one of the gentlemen who became president of the alumni association was Dr. Lloyd Kelly, who is a executive VP with Singer Corporation. Had come mm. out of Link, uh, you know the the um, uh, the uh, what do you call it when airplane pilots test on uh, simulators, right? Simulator, yeah, yeah. Old simulator business with Link, and that had been bought by Singer. So he was a, uh, and I went to visit him uh, at his office on the uh, like 40th floor of uh, of uh, the Rockefeller Center, the tower, right, with his big corner office overlooking Central Park. I mean, whoa, talk yeah. about. So I walked into his that office. First time I got to meet with him, came down from Albany, and I said, "Dr. Kelly, I mean, wow, what a what a place that you have here. What a what obviously what a position." And I said, "You went to Albany State Teachers College back in the '30s. You graduated from a a little teachers college. How did you become this amazing corporate executive?" And I'll never forget what he said to me. He said, "Dave, I've never stopped teaching." Oh wow. And, whoa, you know, here's a man of this executive power, and he still views himself as a teacher. Teacher. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's so powerful. And I've seen you do that in so many different ways. And, you know, from one on one to, you know, one to many, I've seen, you know, and you recently just got to do a keynote opportunity at a, a breakout session, I think, in 10,000 or something in the room. I don't remember the thousands. It was yeah, huge. 3,400, but it was 3, big. 3,400. Yeah. 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 I hadn't been there in a long time, but it was interesting because I came out with that sense of, of passion and mission and to make an impact and not to worry about myself, you know, not to worry about how I was coming across. Uh, and that is always, you always deliver your best when you stop worrying about yourself and start thinking about what it is you want to say. So over the years, I want to try to get to something that I, I you, you've spoke about a few times, but not many times. I mean, over the years, you've had this a very successful career. You've had an impact on many, many people, but you've also had some ups and downs and some struggles yep. through that. Um, yep. And one of those you talked about and how it was pivotal and changing your life was through Alcoholics Anonymous. Yeah, it is. And I think that, you know, what happens is that uh, sometimes you unconsciously, you're, the parts of you that you, you're, you uh, are insecure about kind of come up and, uh, I, I really come from a long legacy of depressed people. My grandfather spent the last 20 years in, in um, the nursing home, totally catatonic virtually. My dad had bad mood swings, also some anger management issues. I began in my 30s to start having cyclical depression, right? Uh, at first we thought it was bipolar, but no, because there weren't any highs. It was just all you know, dipping down and then coming back up. So I had to learn how to manage that. I had to learn how to use the cognitive uh, tools that exist that have been developed further under positive psychology to really learn how to mentally and cognitively manage my mood. But one of the times that I, I got in, like a lot of people do, you know, you do escape stuff. And I got into realizing uh, that I was having problems with alcohol. And so I went to Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, and I remember this one of those funny things. 
I remember going to my first meeting and uh, there was a young kid that couldn't have been maybe 20 years old who was leading the meeting. And I walked in and I said, is this Alcoholics Anonymous? And he went, yeah, yeah. He said, yeah, come on. He said, by the way, here, he handed me a sheet. He said, read this. At the beginning of the meeting, we read a bunch of things. Read this. I went, oh, no, no, I'm just here to observe. I just, I'm, just here to, I'm just here to see things. Check it out. You know, I'm just check it out. He said, yes. no, no, hey, everyone here, you read it. So he was pretty assertive. So he gave it to me and I started reading. And it's a thing called The Promises, which is a page out of the, the, the big book uh, that really describes what happens to you when you really commit to the 12 step process and it's the promises, here's what happens to you. And man, I read through that by about the second paragraph, the tears are coming down my cheeks because that's what I needed. Right. So yeah. I, I, so I finally, uh, I read that and I didn't say I was an alcoholic at that meeting, but two meetings later I said, yeah, I'm Dave, I'm an alcoholic. And what was interesting about that is that in the, in the three steps, you turn your life as part of the first three of the 12 steps, you turn your life and uh, will over to the care of God as you understand him. It's not a religious practice. They let you define what you think God is, but it's turn it over right to your, what they call your higher power. Yes. And what it was for me, Chaz, was, uh, was a path back to my spirituality. It was a path back to my connection with God. Right now I'm working on a series of podcasts called The Seven Incarnations of God, where I've taken my scientific seeker side and combined it with my spiritual side to be able to convey to people why God has shown up at least seven clear ways in the history of, of the universe. Wow. And that it's, and it's, it's, my, it's kind of my attempt to counter the, uh, the uh, arrogant scientific atheists who try and tell everyone there's no reason for any of this belief in a higher power. Come on, get rational, be real. And they're very cynical about this. And, uh, you, know, you know, I just listened to a wonderful song last night by Steve Martin. Remember Steve Martin? Oh, yes, yes. And it's called Atheists Ain't Got No Songs. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? They don't. Atheists yeah. don't have any music. Yeah, The rest of us are singing hymns and celebrating God and positive things and atheists ain't got no songs, right? Well, the reason I say that is because these scientists don't have any eyes. Here mm. they are scientists supposedly observing the wonders of the universe and figuring them out, which I believe in. Go figure it out. There's lots of things we don't understand that we, we want to, yes. right? It's not all just yes. magical. There's yes. lots, of, I believe in science, but here's the thing. To say that there is no creative force, to say there's no higher intelligence, to say there's no God, is to ignore like 90% oh, yeah. of what's out there. So okay. this, you know, I say all that. This is kind of uh, Dave's, Dave's uh, one of Dave's encore adventures. <laughs> all right. I, and by the way, you've shared that with me in, in a, a while back, and I read through it before you, you know, you've sort of done the podcast. And I think it's fantastic. And yeah, I, I agree. I think all, all things around us denote God and 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 share that. And so, by the way, uh, several people commenting, hey, I remember my first meeting too, same story. Dave is a bank of full of experience, knowledge, and wisdom. Thanks for sharing with us. Uh, yeah. Guys, if you have a question, by the way, for Dave too, I'll, I'll shoot it over during yeah. this episode. Um, so here you have this, as you said, this path, this journey. Um, how, how did that impact where, where your career and where your impact from, from there went? Well, like what know, happened? I, think I, I think I was always a seeker. Let me tell you one of the things that I would just share, share with people that's kind of a counter to one of these pab, uh, just kind of positive things that go around. People say, do what you love and the money will follow. And right. see, I, don't, I don't believe that in any way. In my experience, love what you do and the opportunities will follow. I and I will tell you, I have never, including with you, Chaz, been hired for a job uh, because I asked for it. I got hired because people wanted me. And the reason they wanted me was because they saw how well I had done at something else. Correct. And it all kind of built on it. So they, you know, they learned that whatever Dave does, he does with passion. He does it really well. He, he makes a commitment to it. He does what he says he's going to do. And therefore, we want him on our team. So I think when you really, the other thing is, I think when you really give yourself to where you are, you learn the most you can learn. You you, yes. you you learn the knowledge and you build the bandwidth of skill and then that and then that leads you to whatever's next and you can't always know some people have very clear goals about what's next and I understand that and I love that when people have that clarity and they set those goals and action plans and they go for it I teach that I believe it but yes. but so 
but the thing is that that um, it begin with you know giving having gratitude and loving what you do. Yeah, I agree. I you know it's something I've been talking to my own kids about as they start talking about careers. You know now now the schools want them to try to decide their whole future by the time they're like in seventh grade, which is just you know it just it's so dumb. It's just so. So we're talking about it, you know, and we start talking about their interests and things. And, you know, my kids are like, well, like my oldest, he loves outdoors. He likes snakes. He likes this. And I'm like, well, okay, so do research on what opportunities are there and where the money is in that. And he's like, you know, it comes back and there's not a tremendous amount. There's some opportunities, but not a tremendous amount. And I said, well, what if you had a career that you enjoyed, you loved, you did this, but it gave you a lot of opportunity, whether it be freedom and money, et cetera to have your own outdoor place or do your other, you know, do those things. And so I, I agree with what you're saying wholeheartedly and to enjoy every bit of it. I mean, I could think of eight or 10 different stories from business to athletics where people, you know, they committed to the team and they did the best they could. And then their opportunity came, right? Well, the other thing, yes. And I think the other thing I say to youth, I've said it to my grandkids as they, you know, go on in schooling, college, Gramps, what do you think I should you know, focus on. And I say, here's what I said, whatever you do, whatever course you take, whatever program you're a part of, ask yourself two questions. What knowledge am I learning here that I can take for the rest of my life? It'll be enough. Yes. Or what skill am I having a chance to build that I can use later in my life? And if you look at those two things, knowledge and skills, you know, and of course the other one, you and I know this is more in the teaching thing, but an attitude. You yes. know, it's like, what can I learn about successful attitudes? What do I, what can I learn about showing up on time? What can I learn about doing what I say I'll do? What can I learn about managing my own time? What can I, you know, all that stuff leads because I think what people are doing in their life, and this is what I look back on mine. I wish I kind of, in a way, wish I'd maybe done it more intentionally. I think I was very fortunate to sort of do it accidentally, but I continued to build my bandwidth. My yes. bandwidth of things I know about and activities I've done and skills I have is a very wide bandwidth. It's not maybe always deep, <laughs> but oh, I get that. I get that. Very wide. Yeah. Yeah. You you started this. Uh, this is where I wanted to kind of get to, to kind of towards the end of this here is you started the episode talking about remembering and stories and some of that. And some of that was when you spent some time on the road. Yes. You said, you know, that, that windshield time, but there's, a, there's a lot of people now in master networks that, that weren't a part of that. I, I think back to those days, those were fun for you and I, because it was a big growth time for, I think for both of us, actually. It was for both of us. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And uh, you spent, was it three years on the three road? Three years, three years totally um, going, you know, from Airbnb to Airbnb um, yeah. uh, or with friends and yep. just traveling the country, uh, you know, played 235 different golf courses, rode thousands of miles on my mountain bikes, had a whole bunch of different settings, uh, you know, stayed at a whole bunch of Airbnbs, went to 70 national parks, wow. all of that. What a what a wonderful, yeah, what a wonderful life experience. So grateful for that. Now, you weren't entirely homeless because I we, we collected your mail for you over those three years. That well, was a great yeah, I needed, so here's the thing. I needed a mailing address, and it was better to have a mailing address in Texas because they don't have any income tax. So yeah, yeah. You, you allowed me to be my um, place of residence. No, yeah. that's great. It was great. Every, uh, every once in a while, my kids would get the mail, and they'd bring it in every once in a while. Every once in a while, they'd be like, Dad, why is mail coming for Dave to our house? Yeah, <laughs> and where's uh, Dave's room, by the way? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Said, well, you didn't hear he's bunking with you next week. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> so, um, but what, what, are, what were some of the, you know, the breakthroughs or lessons during that time? And when you get, a, you know, that time to look back and reflect and think forward and all of that, right? Like, you know, it's very, very perceptual in the sense that you've got this big uh, windshield to look forward and this tiny rear view to look back. You know, yeah, what the, you know, only only check the rear view mirror to make sure you know what's coming past you, right? I mean, the big yeah. truck and things like that. Otherwise, it's all it's all where you're moving. I'm a futurist anyway, so I've always yeah. I've always looked toward the future. That was that's always what's motivated me. I would say that one of the neat things in was I didn't go into it with a purpose other than actually other than mastering my golf game. I said, you know, I want to see if I can go back and play golf as well as I did when I was younger and played yeah. it as well as I ever had. And I actually did. I actually did go back and, and score better, play better as an old guy than I had when I was younger. But but that was kind of, the, you know, because one of the reasons is, 
you know, being a sort of the life of a high achiever, I liked going into this without any need to perform or accomplish anything, right? Just let it happen. Well, what happened was this wonderful discovery about myself, reviewing my history and all of that. Uh, you and I, uh, you know, that was after we had connected. So I still got to do some work with you yes, on the yes. road uh, while I was doing that. Um, and then I would say I got, this was a, a great foundation. I began to think about the seven incarnations of God, God on this trip. Uh, so it began to rebolster and stabilize or, or maybe enrich my spiritual understanding. And then personally, I'd had trouble in my life with a series of broken relationships, romantic relationships, wives um, and girlfriends. And so I went, I only, not only did I go homeless and jobless, but I went loveless. So during that three years, I didn't date anybody, didn't see anybody. Uh, it just took that on my life. Well, I got to the end of the three years and decided it was really time for to have a special woman in my life. And so I thought about that. Actually, I had a prayer with God on a long hike in uh, in a fountain outside of Fountain Hills, Arizona, and crafted a message that I put on Facebook. And I remember that. I remember it. Very authentic, very revealing, yeah. and then also a description of the kind of woman I was looking for. And a, a dear friend of mine, Kevin Weber from uh, Keller Williams, uh, he and I had worked there together, went to his wife, said, you got to read this. And she read it. And, he, and they both said, Gina. And so they called Gina and said, you got to meet this guy. And I think without their endorsement, she would have never, <laughs> yeah. never wanted to meet me. I was older than she was and all that stuff, you know, had very lived, lived very different lives. So anyway, they connected us. And of course, that's just made my life whole and rich. And we have a wonderful love relationship. So in a way, that was that was sort of the uh, the cherry on top of the of the homeless Sunday. Well, that's right. That's a great description. You know, two things I think about that. I, I think to my to the podcast I did last week uh, with Mark Victor Hansen. And he, he's written this book called Ask. And one of the things he talks about yeah. is from your dreams to your destiny. And he said, you know, there's asking yourself the questions that you need to ask. There's asking God those questions. And then there's asking the universe or putting it out to other people to ask for things. And it's interesting is you kind of went through all three of those, right? You kind of had that internal ask. You asked God. Yeah. And then you asked the world to help yeah. you find. Yes. Right? And, and I think in many times... People are afraid to ask. They're afraid to ask. You know, I, I love when I'm teaching the second discipline, you know, marketing and sales and targeting, I mean, getting getting business. You know, I say that, you know, ask and ye shall receive, right? Absolutely. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and the door shall be open. I said that book was about prospecting and yes. sales. <laughs> and they all, right. and I go, no, you know, maybe it was because I think God said, I created life to be abundant. All you have to do is three things, ask, seek, and knock. Yeah. And I think that's a big deal right there. Ask for what you want, seek for what you want to know, and knock for opportunities that you want opened. Yeah, it's a pretty simple equation, you know, as you just said. I shared this with somebody the other day who was struggling with something, and, you know, ask and receive. Okay, well, some of us struggle with asking, and some of us are pretty good at asking. And then some of us are really good at receiving and some are not good at receiving. <laughs> That's so, right. So there's, there's all those parts come into play. Yeah. Um, and it's important. And I remember meeting Gina the first time uh, at, at one of our events and, and connect. Watched she came to yeah. connect. We, we had only known each other about a month and she came to connect and was, I mean, that, that lit her up about her entrepreneurial interest. She's been a serial entrepreneur, but she never under, quite stood, never quite understood what that meant. She'd done it in these artistic and holistic areas. And now, of course, she's she's a powerful entrepreneur. So. Right. Yeah. So it's been fun to watch. Uh, I was thinking back, what, what was it, 2013 you and I met? 2012, fall, 2012, just right. before Thanksgiving of 2012. Yep. Wow. It's been fun to watch and first of all, experience many things together that we can yes. always look back yeah. on. Yes. And, and then, like I said, to watch the growth together, um, you know, I was, I was part of the sort of the pre going on the road during that you and I stayed connected and then here yeah. kind of that post in it. And then watching my experience of your in, impact in that and, you know, start coming out of a really rough time, 
starting a new business, the ups and downs of that and growing. For you, no, for you, you yeah. understand. And of course, we're everyone is feeling it right now in the chaos of this uh, virus thing. And yeah. I think the thing to remember in this is that these are the testing times. And these are the times where you really build your greatest wisdom and your greatest resilience and your greatest serenity, right? Your, yeah. your ability to stay calm in the chaos. And yeah. this is where you build it right now. I mean, you can't change. And also it's where you where you learn that 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 wisdom of don't give energy to what you can't change, right? And there's so many of the forces playing around us we can't change. All we can do is change, one, our attitude and our mindset and also our actions as it regards to what we can change. Yes. And, you know, it's interesting. I think having gone through things, you've gone through things myself. I think that, you know, if you're listening to this and you haven't gone through those things and you lean on people like Dave and I who have because – We've been no, none of us have been through this, but we've been through things that make us go, okay, we're we're consciously aware of what we're going through and not losing our mind through it. Where maybe the first time we went through something, we didn't do it the right way or we didn't react the right way, but we've learned through this. Well, I've been I've been through times that were as stressful financially. I've been with t times that were as stressful as this is emotionally. I yes. th went through times where my fear level was higher, you know. Yeah, then, right. And then, and so it isn't. It isn't about the society or the, what's going on in the external world. I mean, ep epidemics have been coming and going for like millennia, right? right? And wars come and go, and 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 um, economies go to recession, depression, and uh, you know, all this stuff is just what goes on around us. And our view, and our, I believe spiritually, our role as human beings is to find the the peace and the wisdom that gets us through everything. Yes. And remember that what you're doing now, I mean, I've been, I've been having some just, you know, the blessings of this are some of the things that I've been able to do through it. And some of the conversations I've had with my children and, and some of the others, and to remember that what you're doing now in personal and business, you know, we just sat and we I mean, 46 minutes of story and looking back and history and stuff, yeah. There will be a time you'll look back at this, right? Yeah. There'll be a time you'll look back at this and say, no. this is what I did. This is how I responded. So remember that in the moment yes. that it will pass and you'll want to look back and, and have the lessons. Well, and you'll also not, you'll take the lessons and, and open yourself to the lessons. But also what you want to do is, is behave and think in a way that when you look back on it two years from now, you're proud of how you, how, how the courageous truth and how stalwart and how strong you were in this difficult time. Yeah, yeah. think about that. Yeah, and at times of stress and depression maybe, or fear, as Dave said, let fear be your compass, but also let productivity be your healer. That's it, um, yeah. You yeah. know, get into activity and positivity. And it's yeah. not just to be naive or Pollyanna, but understanding right. as Martin Seligman says in uh, you know, that uh, in his book, Authentic Happiness, that um, it is about having an attitude of gratitude yes. that gets you to the best place. Yes. Yeah. Well, well, Dave, I'm grateful for you spending the time with me Thank today you. and all Thank of our for, audience. The for the reminiscing. <laughs> yeah, it was fun. You know, I mean, I think at times right now we've had many opportunities to have real serious conversations and real uh, I, I did a pot or I did a Facebook live last week and we told some funny story that kind of People were making comments and it kind of took a turn of just fun and silly and we were laughing. But I tell you that the people afterwards kept messaging me privately and said, thanks. I needed to laugh tonight. I needed yeah. the time to just a laugh so serious uh, with, with so much seriousness going on. So yeah. Good to reminisce, Dave. Yeah. Thank you, Chaz. Guys, remember every Monday noon central, I bring you great, amazing people like Dave, successful uh, in their industry, successful in many things. So we're going to share ups, downs, reminisce of the past, uh, different stories. Uh, make sure you share this. Make sure you tag somebody that needs to hear the messages today, uh, the things that we discussed, the things we talk about. Join us on the Mass Networks Facebook page every Monday, noon central, where I bring great people like Dave uh, each week to you to help inspire, uh, inspire motivate, and uh, give you inspiration to continue to succeed. So till next time, we'll see you guys next week. Take care. Introducing the brand new Master Networks University. In times like these, you need to invest in your education. 
You can level up your business knowledge and really hone in on the skills you need to keep growing all from home. It's part of our pledge to educate our members and give them the knowledge they need to succeed. We are Master Networks.